Inga reo. Inga mana pui pui ake. Inga reo tongarerewa e i kapahi nei. Tēnā koutou katoa. Mauri oho. Mauri tu. Mauri ora ki a tātou. Haumie huie. Taiki e. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, SCANS session. We're very excited today to be welcoming an incredible panel to share their thoughts with us on communicating uh, community initiatives to communicate COVID-19. Uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us from the New Zealand Association of Scientists Conference. This is a joint session that we're running uh, in addition to SCANS. For those of you who aren't familiar with SCANS, uh, we are the Science Communicators Association of New Zealand, and we're a network of people who communicate about science and science topics. Uh, we host regular events for people who want to upskill uh, and hone their storytelling skills and connect with other professionals in this area. So I um, encourage you to look and find out more about SCANS, scans.org. Um, we will be introducing each of our panelists uh, four panelists today. There has been a, a change to our lineup, so we'll explain that in a moment. Uh, and then uh, a Q&A at the end. So we welcome all of you who are attending. If you could please make use of the chat box in order to uh, share your thoughts and your questions. If you have a question for a specific panelist, it would be very helpful if you could make that clear uh, in the chat when you add your question. And we'll hold all those questions to the end once our panelists have had a chance to speak to us. Uh, and we will then, I'll read out your questions and we'll carry on. So please share your thoughts. It will make this a very uh, much more lively and interesting discussion. Um, so we are joined today um, at very short notice. Uh, <laughs> so thank you to uh, our, our panelists, our new panelists. Um, we'll be hearing first from Rawari from Rawari Jensen. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Michelle Dickinson. Then Awarangi Tamahere, well, I'll give you a bit more background. Uh, she's with Tifana Owai Pereira Trust, uh, and she uh, holds a number of roles. Um, has been, she's Chief Operating Officer. She's on a number of boards as well. Um, I have a little introduction um, from, for her, for Awarangi's career spans the public sector, working in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and social reform. Uh, and other government agencies through to the private sector, establishing and leading the KPMG Maori consulting team. Her initial career was as a speech language therapist before moving into management roles and focusing on broader social reform. Working with her own iwi has taken many roles, including implementing on the ground for Maori by Maori mechanisms for delivery, catalyst for a continued focus on supporting aspirational change amongst her people. So thank you, Avarangi, for uh, stepping in in place of Vicky. Uh, who was unable to join us this morning. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so we'll begin uh, with Rawari, if you would like to uh, lead us out, please, telling us a bit more about the work you've been doing, communicating uh, with uh, a number of different communities, with port workers, with border workers, and with uh, gangs, with many other initiatives you've been involved in. I'll hand over to you, Rawari, to tell us more about your experiences. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora tātai. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me. And um, just to be clear, I've been given permission to swear because I'm a bit sweary. And that's my Twitter handle. I expect you to follow me. Um, so I'll just see if I can click forward. So the pandemic has um, created opportunity for a, a hell of a lot of responses. And I'm interested in talking about specifically uh, responses which are Māori led. And so Te Rōpū Whakakaupapa Urutā established within about 36 hours, um, more than 100 Māori um, clinicians, uh, health researchers, health policy managers, you know, a whole bunch of people and we've been going since um, mid-March last year and we're still going now and what we're really interested in doing is advocating um, so that we get the best possible outcomes for Māori during this pandemic. You'll see that there's other community responses and the uh, roadblocks or checkpoints or variously named um, protective responses by communities. Um, I'm really interested in noticing that as a tino rangatiratanga response, 
if you've ever read any of the Waitangi Tribunal reports, the Muri Whenua report um, and Judge Tai Hakure uh, jury um, made it clear that it was a fisheries report, but he made it clear that the power to say no is a act of sovereignty. And so in regards to you know, who can fish in this area and when they can fish, you know, the power to say no is about tino rangatiratanga. And I think that these roadblocks or checkpoints were equally an expression of the power to say no. And then coming to the vaccination program, I had um, opportunity to go around the country. I've got some um, shots up here where on the left-hand side, you can see um, Tina Ngato invited Kate Hanna, myself, Susie Wiles, and Dr. Avri Taonui to attend a community event where they wanted to be educated for their own purposes. And then they spent two days having a workshop about what it all meant. And then they come out with a program that works for them. And that's actually the origin of the um, program Karafua, which has um, got some traction uh, nationally. It's gone on to become the um, self-funded or community-funded um, bus doing vaccinations in the East Coast, um, Kahi Pahi. Um, I noticed that there's events like the um, Papakura Marae drive-through vaccination um, program. Uh, the rest of those shots are whānau waipareira, and I'm going to kind of skip over that gently because Awurangi will be able to give you uh, some much deeper understanding of the what and the how and the why, but just notice that there are a lot of Māori organisations that are saying we want to do this for our own community, and many of them do it not just for Māori, but do it for the whole community because we're all safer. This shot here tells a story of we've got the um, the uh, drive-through vaccination program running out at uh, West at Trust Stadium and the, we had a weather bomb hit. And just to be clear, within three hours, going from left, where we had a drive-through vaccination running the day before, uh, through to the storm that hit, three hours later, we were set up and running inside the whare, inside the trust stadium. And none of that required permission from somebody else. This was an act of tino rangatiratanga. We are gonna serve our community and because the weather had blown all the tents over, we had to do the right thing. We had whānau who were coming in that day and we were gonna be ready for them. And so we got that job done. And then this slide is just talking to the, you know, being around all around the show doing these kind of things with uh, Tomaranui or, um, you know, some of the gangs or hard to reach communities. Uh, we've done this sort of work in Auckland and in Marawahia and around the country, been up to Kaikohe. So, you know, literally from the north uh, through to the east and the west and just haven't had time to go to the south. But the point is that effectively there's 1,000 Māori communities in Aotearoa who are interested in protecting their whānau and their community. And I think the provocation is that we've got to support that happening. So. He, you know, if I distill it into four bullet points, I'd say authentic partnerships are required and share the power, share the power, share the resources, empower Māori communities to do this. And if you can help, then get busy. But if you can't help, then get out of the way. Let us do this. So that's me. Over. Peace. Out. Excellent. Um, very keen to explore a bit more of that in the Q&A. So if you've got questions about those initiatives, be sure to ask them right now in the chat box and we'll save them for Rauri towards the end. We'll hand over next to Michelle Dickinson, who is uh, known to many of you as Nano Girl. Uh, we go back quite a long way uh, and it's been interesting to see uh, her develop in these very different directions. Uh, we've heard about uh, quite a bit of work Michelle's been doing with uh, schools, with uh, questions from parents, from teachers, from many other groups. So I'm very keen to hear more about Michelle's experiences moving beyond sort of that um, from the, the media uh, perspective through to that more intensive one-on-one uh, -on -one and one-to-small group engagement. Kia ora, Michelle. 
Thank you, Daisha. We do go back. My whole reason for being a science communicator is purely due to the Science Media Center and a course I went on a decade ago. So thank you. Um, I would like to show you this picture. And if you didn't know about COVID and I showed you this picture, it might conjure up an image of something. Now, if I add a little bit of text to my picture, um, maybe, just maybe, you might think this is a scary movie. <laughs> and the challenge we have as scientists is that we identify certain features, certain words um, around what has been COVID-19 and, and the virus. And what we haven't really thought about is if you don't have a background in science, this could look like your worst sci-fi horror movie quite legitimately. And the things that you have learned about life through movies um, could actually be the things that you are afraid of. And so sometimes I think as scientists, it's really easy to forget that we have been through a journey, obviously a very long journey for many of us, decades of things that we've learned along the way, ways of thinking, ways of protocol. And as a science communicator, it's really easy for us to think that science communicator is me, the scientist, communicating with you, maybe the non-scientist, to tell you something. But if we actually look up the word communication, it's about exchanging. And I want to focus on this word. Exchanging means that I don't just tell you stuff, but you tell me stuff. And one of the things I haven't really seen too much of at the beginning of COVID was people telling us stuff. I felt like it was a lot of scientists going, let me tell you this, let me define this for you. Let's just tell you what's going on. And I'm not convinced we did as much listening as we could have done because we as scientists were on a journey. We'd been on a journey. We had experience in our past that allowed us to go, well, I know that this equals this and I know what a hypothesis is and I know how to read academic papers and I know how to draw a conclusion from lots of little um, different studies. And I think, you know, there was a there was a little bit of catch up that was needed um, right at the beginning to go, actually, it's not just about telling you about the virus, it's about telling you about the scientific process, something that actually may be different for different cultures, may have different information and, and may be communicated differently. So the strategy that we took at NanoGirl Labs is one of exchange and exchange means listening as well as speaking. And this has been a big part of what we have been doing here. So to give you some context, we one of the big projects we're working on right now is um, redeveloping the year 10 science curriculum for four Pacific Island nations. It's a big MFAT project. We're just about finished. And in doing this, we're taking standard year 10 science curriculum, biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, and most of these, so we're doing it in Samoa, Tonga, uh, the Solomon Islands, and the Cook Islands. And in many of these countries, they've been using New Zealand textbooks to teach science, but most of the examples were not relevant, the ingredients were not relevant, the examples were not relevant, and there was no respect of local and indigenous knowledge into this. So we've been building this system so that their year 10 science books actually correlate to, to their people and, and what they have around them. And to start this, we spent six months of just sitting and listening. And in that time, I have learned a lot about what science means to different people. But one of the things, and this has taught me a lot about working with communities that are, are not your own. I'm just gonna show you a female reproductive system, which many of you, you probably weren't expecting this in a COVID talk. Many of you might be like, oh yeah, I know those bits. I've seen that in a textbook before. I sort of get what they are. Um, we, I included this image in, in the textbook we were writing for Samoa and it was staunchly rejected. And I was told very clearly, even in science, the female reproductive system is not to be taught. Men do not discuss it and women do not need to know about all of those bits. And so I had to remove basically all of the fundamental information because in Samoa, sometimes the reproductive system is taught by church leaders, it's taught in church groups. I had to respect that this is a sacred thing and, and we don't talk about this. And the reason why it became it really helped me understand some things is because then when we were talking about COVID, one of the biggest fears around COVID is, does it affect my fertility? 
And it's very easy for me to go, well, no, here's a paper about it doesn't affect sperm, it doesn't affect eggs. We've seen the studies in IVF, there's been no decrease in pregnancies. But actually, before I do all of that, I needed to talk about what do people know and who can have conversations about fertility. And so one of the things we did was a, a New Zealand Herald podcast with a, a Fesso Collins, who actually said in my podcast, I cannot talk about fertility because I am a man. And, and that was a really important thing that we carved into this podcast to go. It's important that people know that we're not all having the same conversations about the same thing. It was also important for us to do some, you know, some debunking of some really common myths. So we did the, does a spoon stick to you? Yes. Is it magnetic? No sort of things. But more importantly, what we were seeing is, and what we were hearing was questions from people that stated this. I saw a video. My friend said, have you seen? Did you know? And it's really easy as a science communicator to go, oh, don't watch that video. It's on BitChute. Do you not know about BitChute? Or you know, and it's really easy to dismiss them. But I think as science communicators, the way we've been communicating is also by video. And so if you remember the public, it's really hard to assess which of the videos are true, which are not, which are good sources, which are bad. And actually what we did, and, and it worked very well for us, is we asked this as our first question, which is not the question you often ask as a science communicator doing science communication. But we asked this, how are you feeling? Let's talk about that. And by starting with asking people how they were feeling, we were able to get to basically the core of their fears, their misunderstandings, what they've heard, where they've heard it from, who said this, but more importantly, how they felt and that feeling of being frightened, not in control, not knowing where to turn to. And from there, we were able to go, okay, that must feel terrible. I can empathize with that. I would not want to feel those things either. How can we help you to feel differently? What do you need? How can we provide that for you? And that conversation is not something that typically science communicators do. We're very good at going, hey, I know all the science. Let me tell you the science that is right. Instead of going, hey, how are you feeling? Can I help you with those feelings? So that's sort of our big approach is um, empathy first. And we did a huge thing for the Ministry of Education, which um, involves some videos and, and things. And, and the reason why that is really important is we started with how are you feeling? And we let all the teachers in New Zealand have a space to just let us know how they're feeling. It was anonymous. I don't know, we got about seven or 8,000 feelings and how you're feeling and questions into our database, all anonymous. And then we ran free webinars, small groups with teachers. And I do a lot of professional development with teachers. So I know a lot of these teachers. I've met them personally. We have a relationship. We've had a relationship for years. And we address these really hard feelings. We address these really hard questions in a, in a safe space and in a space that um, I think was less about let me tell you the facts and more about, wow, that must feel terrible. How can we help you to feel better? And for me as a science communicator who previously was like, let me tell you what I know. It's really helped me to reflect on, it's not about what we know. It's not about what other people know. It's about creating listening spaces for each other and making sure that everybody is okay. So I'll hand back over. Tenakwe, Michelle, thank you for that. Uh, lots there and some questions coming in. Um, um, you've been doing some incredible work, Stefano Waipareira. I've been noticing the uh, widespread, uh, beautiful campaigns that you've, you've seen coming out, the Proud to be Māori, the uh, Fight for your Whakapapa, which is uh, just, yeah, beautiful. If you haven't seen them yet, please look for them. Beautiful videos, absolutely uh, incredible. And I'd love to hear a bit more about your experiences uh, and what uh, it's been like uh, from that perspective, getting the word out and also the work you've been doing on the ground. Oh, kia ora. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And firstly, just um, um, all the best to all of you and your families. We're in extraordinary times in New Zealand. And um, for everyone being online, I understand there'll be all sorts of situations you're going through just to acknowledge that, you know, it's a tough time for everyone. And we're all writing the textbook as we go into this response. The textbook is not written for us. So it's one of those extraordinary times for all of us 
and all of our ways as we contribute to what we're dealing with in New Zealand in this pandemic. The first thing for me on the communication strategy and the approach that we've taken is an evidence-based approach to what works best for Māori communities. And we have a final order model, which is about wrapping around families in a way that makes sense to them. And what we know from our final order model from an evidence-based approach when we've done social return on investment and outcomes is that anything that you engage with whānau must be ground up and it must be owned by them if you're going to get enduring outcomes. That's the most scientific knowledge and evidence that we have. That also transfers to our communication strategy. So if a communication strategy is developed by a third based, uh, a third party organization somewhere in Wellington, top down, it does not work. It might work for a moment in time, but it does not engage deeply, nor does it see strong uptake by the communities we serve to get the messaging across that we need to get across. That's probably the underpinning focus of what I'm talking about. Um, the second thing for us, it's about, the, for us is that I'll put, start with my Waipareta hat on, is that Waipareta is actually an anchor organisation, an anchor NGO in West Auckland. So it serves the whole of West Auckland, not just Māori. And we acknowledge that when we started in Level 4, we had done probably in about the first five or six weeks, 90,000 vaccinations of West Auckland community, of which 5% were Māori. So we acknowledge that we have a, a bigger role than just Māori. But when we saw that, it was time that because the uptake for Māori for vaccinations was so low, we had to pivot and change around to a strategy that we would know would work best in our communities. That was leveraged off, first of all, earlier this year in May. We did what was called a Proud to be Māori campaign. It was looking at leveraging off some of the negative um, criticism that was coming across about Māori. Um, there was a whole lot of things with Hobson Pledge and so forth. And it wasn't about selling a product, wasn't about selling a service. It was about something where Māori had installed their petrol tanks fueled again, if you like, about feeling a sense of pride, about having some hope and about having some belief in who they were. That campaign over six weeks saw an engagement of 27 million, which was phenomenal for us. We did not believe that would take that much. But when you're starting with a campaign that is grassroots based, that is based off wording, knowledge and community grassroots leaders, it has a totally different momentum than if it was a, an approach done from the top down. As a result of that, um, in installing some of the initial belief, hope and trust, we then, that started to pave the way when we started going to level four lockdown about how do we now leverage off that to increase the uptake of vaccinations across Māori. So Waipareta then went to the next step and took the learnings from that and went to look at a um, fight for your whakapapa campaign for West Auckland. And so we changed it to warlike languaging because we saw that it was very much an action. It was a call to action to start to look at and it was a 24 hour, it was a 48 hour turnaround to get that campaign based off the um, information from the previous campaign. Um, we then extended it right across Tamaki Makoto because you know Tamaki Makoto was in a full lockdown. So we extended it to our fellow Final Order partners right across Auckland, the Fight for Your Whakapapa campaign. That meant we had a website, that meant we had a 20, we had a 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, 0800 for Māori phone number that we were bringing. We had all sorts of collateral they could use. And then just two weeks ago, we are putting on my Whānau Order hack now, we have 81 Whānau Order partners right across the North Island. And so because of the success of that campaign, the engagement in that campaign, we have now two weeks ago rolled out the whole Fight for Your Whakapapa campaign across 81 partners in the North Island. It consists of local ambassadors, local leaders on the ground who have all sorts of content that can be used by our partners on the ground. It consists of media content. It consists of www.fightforyourwhakapapa um, website. We have an on-time live um, page where everybody can see exactly where all the vaccination centres, mobile clinics run by our partners are right across the North Island. We also have a 24-hour Kayarahi online hotline so that people can ring up straight away and ask for help from Fine Order partners. So in this process, while we've been a pandemic, it's had to be a very quick response and move very quickly to be able to engage with our partners. And you know, the most successful engagement is when you see other people um, put up content. So kia ora rawari. that's awesome seeing that there. But what we've also had to do, it's, not, it's traditional, it's not just digital, it's traditional. 
So we have physical billboards and billboards in some paddocks out of Rotoria, for example. So you can't just focus on a digital campaign. You have to focus on what works for the communities they serve and what type of media best works for them. And then more recently, we've just come back from this week where we got together Whānau Waipara has 70 staff that collaborated with all the Whānau partners um, in Taitukaro in the northern region to actually do an intensive one week campaign supporting vaccinations in the north. So this is about growing a movement. This is about emotional attachment. This is about not focusing on what doesn't work, just focusing on what does work and how do we keep, get to our people on the ground in the quickest way possible. It also means changing our languaging. So when we went up north, for example, we took the languaging of Fight for Whakapapa and we see the Farn Order Battalion is coming to the northern front of Te Tai Tukaro on a vaccination intensive campaign. Imaging is really important like that. Wording and languaging is really important to enable that call to action. So that's a bit of a summary from me, Deja. Wow, koe, awerongi. amazing. Uh, just, yeah, great to hear those insights, particularly about how you've adapted and what has worked, you know, having a sense of, um, um, yeah, moving away from this focus on what's not working and really just charging ahead. So, ngami hiki um, To Phil now, uh, Phil Cox, um, he is from the University of Otago, but uh, here today to talk to us about some of the work that he has been doing uh, on Māori like COVID communication strategies, in particular with his hapu. So, over to you, Phil. Uh, just a special acknowledgement to the uh, speakers um, who have preceded me, um, some awesome mahi um, being done and a lot of the points I'm going to make um, are really repeats of other people's points anyways. Um, so one of my roles as a kaipu tao um, within a, you know, that comes from a Māori community and, and, and identifies as Māori. Um, is to operate at the interface, I guess, of Western science institutions and knowledge, particularly in gene technologies, um, with Ma and at, at, at between that interface and Māori communities. Um, and over my career, I've been able to multiple times provide advice and support for iwi and hapu, where I come from, which is Ngāti Rākai Pāka, Rōmai Wahini Ngāti Kamuniki Tawairo. Uh, regarding scientific initiatives, uh, various scientific initiatives that impact within our rohe, um, as a tangata um, taurahere, um, I don't live in our um, in our haukanga, I live a long way away down here in Otipoti, Dunedin. Um, so it's one way that I can put meaning to and action um, the principle of whanaungatanga by providing my skills and advice back to our, our people. Um, so examples of what I've done in the past include, you know, 10 years I was a technical advisor to Ngāti Dākai Pāka regarding the health and ancestry study, um, various timber processing initiatives um, in the wider area, um, to, working with on, and on behalf of, of whānau. Um, I also initiated a help broker repatriation of the white flower Nutakaka genotype um, back to my daughter's people, Ngāti Hini Hika, um, who are from Taranga, um, and some other stuff. Um, as well. Um, so what what this kind of presence of having a, a, a kaipu da, a scientist on the side of, of our communities does is that it addresses this lower uh, capacity and capability in the, in the specialist science knowledge areas so that our people can interact on a more equitable basis when uh, science challenges and initiatives are brought to their communities. Um, but it also provides at least one um, science trained Māori lens on the researchers, uh, on the scientists, and to make sure that the science is ticker, but also that the scientists themselves are puno in their, uh, that they're honest in, in their intent. So in this particular in the, um, initiative I want to talk about today, um, my daughter and my ex-wife, both of whom work for Tūruki, the Māori arm of the Hawke's Bay District Health Board, um, contacted me and expressed um, concern uh, around the low levels of vaccination um, within uh, Rungo Mai Wahine uh, which is where I come from. Um, so what I did was broker a conversation between uh, two vaccine experts, um, um, James Usher and Kurt Kraus, um, who in buildings nearby where I'm sitting right now, um, who to talk about both COVID as well as the Pfizer vaccine itself. Um, at, uh, on a Zoom call um, with Rangatahi and Pākeke, um, who were 
basically at a, at a hui uh, located in uh, Kaiku Marae um, in Tamahia. So I was doing, I did that in coordination with um, Wahine Iwi Trust representatives as well as local um, health providers and responsible for vaccination in the wider area such as Kahununu Executive. So it was a multi-party initiative. Um, so what what worked in that particular corridor? Um, it clarified, first of all, the understanding of the system. But after 20 years of talking to Māori communities and representing Māori communities um, in regard to gene technologies, the fact that there was so much vaccine hesitancy driven by distrust of the government was absolutely no surprise. It was just, you know, this, this was something that um, we could have, we did, um, and not just myself, Rawari and others. Um, knew that our communities would be very, very concerned and, and, and vaccine hesitancy would be quite rife. So we answered preset questions and, and, and concerns. So Michelle talked about how are you feeling? So out of how are you feeling, um, what's give, driven, driven by those concerns are things that we don't know. And so um, what we gave the rangatahi and pākeke that we talked to, the opportunity, first of all, to provide us with questions and comments and concerns that they have. And then myself, James and uh, Kurt talked about various components of um, our knowledge, because I have a PhD in the area of host pathogen interaction, although I don't work on COVID directly. Um, so we, we, we ran this session. Um, I talked really more about the, the, the systemic um, components of the, our science system and that university researchers are actually not in the government's back pocket. We're not telling some kind of line that um, has been dictated to us by Big Pharma or, or by some ministry that we are actually protected by co um, contents of the nation legislation. And we can say what we think is right. That's what we're paid to do. And that there is no censoring by any other entity on our opinions. So I think that helped to remove some of the distrust, the uh, immediate outcomes from that particular initiative. Um, and it was a low cost cost in the no, 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 no money changed hands, um, no, um, it, was, it wasn't expensive to run, it was just simply an information quick Q&A session. Um, so vaccination bookings, we were reported back to us from DHB as well as from the, um, the mobile health providers in wider, um, is that our vaccination bookings increased, um, both the trust, the Aroma Wahine Iwi Trust, um, DHP as well, were happy, well, Tūruki folks were happy with the outcomes. Um, and we also were able to provide non-government um, information, online information sources um, that Rangatahi and Pākeke could actually follow up with and get further information if they wish to. Um, so why a community-led approach is um, crucial. The first thing I wanted to say is Tikanui Kitia is the face seen as a as a principle within um, talking with Maori communities. If it was if we had the resources, we would have gone to Kaiku. Zoom is a um, is, is is second best, but it's better than nothing. Um, so it enabled us to have the opportunity to be to be at least face to face in one sense, um, and to remove the lack of faith and distrust in the system, as I said before, that pervades Maori communities. It also find, provides a way a, a Maori way of interacting. Um, this 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 whakatauki tate ranga te tono kahi kōrero. Um, which is essentially the talk is the food of chiefs that enables us to talk together. Um, so communication and Maori ways of communicating, traditionally ma traditional Maori ways of communicating um, in Maori environments um, is something that actually, when we think of what the the Whare Nui is about, what the Marae is about, it's a place of safety, it's a place of comfort. If we go into those places of safety and comfort, then we are now starting in a process to actually remove the distrust, to actually improve conversation and to get um, those sorts of concerns on the table. I'm not going to propose this as a panacea solution, though. Um, I don't think it is. Um, it deals with the vaccine hesitant who are still on, on the on the path for seeking information. It does not deal with anti-vax conspiracy theorists, um, and nor does it deal with those who are not information seekers, but, inform but, but also vaccine hesitant and other initiatives such as um, the ones um, that have been already described to you would be more effective at addressing those kinds of, at, at those kinds of communities. Really what I want to say though is that non, not one size fits all, multiple strategies are required um, that are designed and implemented by Māori 
Māori communities uh, consistent with tikanga, tikanga a hapu, tikanga a marae, tikanga a iwi. Um, that, and those approaches have to be mana enhancing for all of those people involved in the conversations. And those approaches need to also uh, acknowledge the heterogeneity within our people. You know, mention has been made of gangs, they're part of their, their communities themselves. Um, they are part of who we are. Um, as a people. Um, there are obviously there need to be specific strategies for different sets of groups. Um, so um, that's really all I have to say today. Um, what I, if, if, if anything, uh, the key message here is, is, is what I've said before, Tā te rangatera tōnukai he kōrero. Um, we have to be talking to each other in a way that is mana enhancing. And so the one, the unidirectionality of, of, of messaging is not necessarily, as we've heard today, mana enhancing. Often it's not. Um, so therefore we have to change that equation. Kia ora. Tēnā koe, Phil. Uh, yes, really uh, fantastic insights, uh, particularly around that, the role, uh, the importance of making sure that uh, the type of interaction, that is the thing that's really the bedrock there. It's what's so important. Um, so uh, remind all of you to add your questions into the Q&A. Um, I want to say that um, I lead the Science Media Center and we're a group that really focuses on um, joining scientists and researchers with uh, journalists. And throughout COVID, we've seen you know, a, a really huge response from scientists and researchers just stepping up and uh, meeting that huge demand that there has been from, from the media for uh, to answer questions, to help provide context for every new stage of what's been happening throughout the pandemic. Um, the inspiration for this panel really came from uh, a COVID expert panel that we convened. Uh, we've been doing that throughout, throughout COVID. Um, it was ahead of the Super Saturday event and it was um, some of the thoughts that came through there, just realizing that there is, um, uh, a huge role for those kinds of you know, mass uh, communication uh, initiatives, but there's really, uh, as we've heard reflected in the panel in, in your experiences so far, um, a point at which that really one-on-one, -on -one, that intensive, um, more, um, you know, not the kind of thing that can be just picked up and put somewhere else, but you know, the specific ground up uh, kind of communication is what really uh, changes attitudes and actually um, helps to make a difference in, in and those who um, are not reached necessarily by uh, uh, what's come up until this point. Um, so we just wanted to hear a bit more. Um, we've got some questions that are building on that. So um, we'll start out with a question for Rawari, um, which is coming from Nancy Longnecker, um, who's asking for you to expand a bit more on what you think works uh, for approaching hard to reach communities, she said. So she's given some examples of um, of gangs, for example, sex workers, um, people with um, mental health and addiction issues. Your yeah, thoughts, please, Rabbi. So I've got a couple of sort of high level comments and then I'll notice the difference between those groups. So first of all, I think the important thing is regarding trust is be trustworthy. So that's on us to be trustworthy. Uh, I think we've got to listen and respond. We've got to be reliable. And so, those kind of um, resonate with what Michelle was talking about, I think. But gangs as a group are really organized, very, very organized. So that organization is often constructed about keeping official authority out and away. But when they're ready, they organize. And so the, all of the gang events I've been to have been um, really well attended, really well organized. Um, they told me what they wanted me to do, turn up and answer these questions. And they had, um, you know, very clear ideas about how it was going to run. And they were able to um, corral all of their uh, membership to turn up pretty much on time at a certain place and prepare their questions. And uh, some of those were, you know, also required the gang members to have had a negative test before they come. Um, all of them had requirements around masks and social distancing and, you know, so really well-run events. Um, you mentioned about addicts, and I think uh, we do need to provide access. So if you've asked the family to isolate at home um, and somebody's a cigarette addict, they will leave the house to go and get cigarettes. So we've got to provide cigarettes. And I'm, you know, I'm right into 
tobacco-free Aotearoa, but you know what? Get over myself and fucking give some cigarettes to people who are self-isolating. And for that matter, can we get over ourselves and also provide some alcohol? If somebody in the house has got a bit of an addiction to alcohol, are we ready to get over ourselves and allow the Uber driver to deliver the, you know, other illicit substances? Well, you know, we've got to we've got to figure out what we mean when we say we're here to help. And we have to be ready to stand by and let somebody get through the COVID outbreak that you know requires them to isolate safely at home. And we can work on the cigarette addiction later. We can work on the alcohol stuff later. We can work on the illicit substances stuff later. Um, sex workers, again, very different group. Um, they're often very, very organized with respect to hygiene. And actually it's their customers who don't want to admit that they need to isolate because, well, where were they? last night at 11 15 p.m or are they saying that they were at a supermarket or a petrol station? no they were at a fucking so we've got to get over ourselves about the kind of um judgmental stuff actually sex workers are often really really well organized so i want to get to the hardest group and actually the hardest group to reach is the housing precariat and so about five months ago, we started working on what the vaccination support program would be for emergency housing in Auckland. And there's, um, there's seven providers of emergency housing services to the rough sleeping. So anyway, we ended up with a program that we'd agreed that we were going to completely you know, deliver a service to meet all of the emergency housing providers. So in August, when our outbreak really starts to get ahead of steam, then we discover that actually our system has got a fucked up way of understanding what emergency housing is. So that's emergency housing for rough sleepers is seven providers. That does not cover any of the transitional housing providers. That does not cover any of the emergency housing providers for MSD, which is converted motels. And you'd have a guess how many motels have been converted into emergency housing in Auckland. Just type it into the chat. I'll tell you if anybody gets it right. That doesn't cover any of the boarding houses in Auckland. Just type into the chat. What's your guess of how many boarding houses licensed there are in Auckland? Because actually we've got a whole lot of boarding houses which are not licensed and we turn a blind eye because we're worried if we impose some sanctions on them being unlicensed, then we'll turf out a whole lot of people. We don't know where they're going to go. So we kind of just, we're going to turn a blind eye to the unlicensed. Nobody's typed in. Come on, they sure what's going on. These people, are you there people? Type in a guess, come on. Yeah, well, come on, let's show some support. Let's see some activity, guys. Yeah. Someone be brave. There we go, we got a Someone guess. Someone be brave, all right, brave. Yeah, so there's, there's exactly, it's about 140 motels have been converted into emergency housing. There's 297 boarding houses licensed in Auckland, and there's an unknown number of unlicensed boarding houses. Tell you what I'm working on today. We're trying to work with somebody whose address is called Under the Bridge. And we're working with Fano who are living under a bridge in Auckland, and we're trying to move them into MIQ. So, you know, this, that's the hardest to reach because they are really desperate and they're not in organized groups where we can just call them all together and come together. So the hardest to reach groups are actually the most at risk. And partly because as a society, we have left them for about five years. This has been a growing thing, this housing crisis. We've got this crisis called COVID and some of you think, how can anybody not know that we've got a crisis called COVID? It's on the news, it's on TV, it's in the papers. But same, coming back at you, how can any of you not know we've got a housing crisis? It's been on the news, it's been on TV, it's been in the newspapers and guess what? That's where COVID gets busy. Peace out. Oh, thank you, Ravadi. Yes, absolutely been very front of mind with um, watching what's happened with uh, this, with the Delta outbreak and seeing uh, how, uh, you know, those communities that have needed help for so long uh, were right at the core of, you know, the, we had plenty of opportunity to prepare for this. Um, Awarangi, did you have anything to add on, on that question, on that topic? Oh, just, need to oh, just that, um, just that, it, nothing really, Rowdy said it all, it's just that you have to do totally different approaches, totally different tools in the toolkit. We were in the middle of Pangaru last week, one of our teams were there, 
we have in Waipareira, we have these cars that have speaker phones on them, sound systems up the top. They go up and down the streets talking to people. We took those cars right up into Pangaru. We went out in the middle of nowhere. We put a nanny as a co-pilot with our driver. We went up every single house. We actually got 10 families, as some of them no doors on their houses, would never come in, and we brought them in 25 kilometres to get vaccinated. So um, the reality is the politics of poverty was there before COVID, right? And so, so many of our people, they actually, a lot of them do want to get vaccinated, but you've got to reach them. I mean, the reality for them, as Rawadi said, it's food on the table, it's a warm house, it's dealing with other issues in the house. They might have the best intention to get vaccinated, but you have to go to them. You have to use totally different tools in your toolkit to get them. And last week in those rural communities was an absolute example of highlight of how you do that. Uh, well, we have you spotlit there, Kawarangi. Another question, this is from Laura Goodall. Um, how are you dealing with the fact that many organizations like supermarkets are making masks mandatory condition of entry and also the policy of no jab, no job, uh, which seems to be in conflict, she says, with Tino Varanga Tiratanga? Uh, is this acting as a barrier to mask wearing and vaccinations in Māori other communities? That's one perception, but always it is in final order. You go to the whānau themselves, you understand what is the barrier for them first, right? And when you start to have trust with a kaimahi, a worker, working with that family, who know how to work with them, who have the trust with them, and you start to take away, if you like, the layers of the onion, you get to the heart of the real issue of what it is. And actually, that might perceive to be the issue, but in fact, underneath it all, it's not about that. It's about the fact that they, they, don't, they don't trust the system for so many different reasons. And when they build a trust and connection with an organization or people that they feel connected with on the ground, it totally, totally changes how you can work with them to start to build up their own approaches to wearing masks, to looking at how they can get vaccinated, right? So we might have a perception of what the barrier is out here. But unless you put people on the ground who are from the community who can build the trust up and work and talk to them their way and understand really what the issues are first, later down the track, you might get to the fact that then as a result of that conversation, different strategies, they start to wear um, masks and so forth. Because what we think the issues are and what they really are when you talk to them on the ground are actually so different, so different. So it's a ground up approach to every single family is absolutely key to be able to work with them in a way that has their mana intact, work with them in a way that brings them on the journey of slowly working towards vaccination, because you're engaging with communities first and engaging in conversations to get vaccinated. You're not going straight to them on the door, knock on the door and say, get vaccinated. That's not gonna work. Getting vaccinated for some of our communities may be a longer term option, but they will get there. But you can only go as fast as the trust as you have of that family in that community. And you have to ha understand how to work with them to slowly get to the point of readiness to deal with those things. Kia ora. Thank you for that. We have a question for Michelle here now um, from Georgia, looking to see if you have any thoughts on whether there is a good way to tell whether it's worth debunking a particular myth or when it's best not to give it any oxygen. I know, Michelle, this is not a simple question. Uh, there are lots of different thoughts on this, um, but you're someone who's had to wade into this. So what have you learned? Yeah, and, and look, um, I don't, there's lots of opinions about this. And one of the opinions is don't even give it oxygen because the second you give it oxygen is when it starts to get more oxygen and we talk about it more. Um, but then the other thing is if we don't address it, then it becomes the truth that everybody knows and there's nothing out there. So it is complex. More than debunking the myths, what I've been trying to do is empower people to think about the problem. So the spoons and the magnet was a great example. There were people who were sticking spoons to themselves and go, especially their arm around their vaccination site, lots of videos, especially locally made videos of, you know, especially Māori, uh, there's this beautiful video. Uh, it's a, a Māori woman and her Māori grandmother sitting there and she's sticking spoons to her grandmother. And it's incredibly frightening. And it's, she's just got the vaccine and now she's magnetic. So rather than go, well, that's silly. There's nothing magnetic in the vaccine. You go, who's got a fridge magnet? I've got a fridge magnet. Who's got a spoon? Oh, I've got a spoon. Put your fridge magnet and your spoon together and see what happens. And nothing happens because spoons are made out of stainless steel, which is not very magnetic. So once you actually take a magnet and a spoon together and go, well, magnetism isn't going to attract this spoon. I've got a strong magnet on my fridge and it doesn't attract the spoon. 
then it can't be magnetism that is sticking it to my body. And then we talk about being sweaty and how the magnet sticks and adhesion and all of those things. But actually, I think people are willing to debunk on their own if you just give them the tools to go, okay, well, that's a great thing being magnetic. Let's let's have a look at how magnetic spoons are. Oh, they're not. <laughs> and then people go, oh, okay, well, if they're not, then I'm on a journey now to go, well, that can't be true. Well, that must be misinformation because I have done the experiment myself. So a lot of the work I do is not about saying that is not true because it's about empowering people to go, well, how could we see if that was something that was true? How could we find more information? The pregnancy one and fertility is another. Um, I guide people on, well, if it's affecting fertility, then we would have seen fertility rates around the world decrease. How do we find that information so that you can make a judgment on, is this affecting fertility? Um, but yeah, it's a very personal decision about what to debunk and what not to debunk. I tend to do what TV is pushing me to do. Um, if there's something that we're really seeing in, and you know, Seven Sharp often has a lot of questions on the same topic, then they'll call me in and be like, this is really important. We're getting a lot of public stuff. That's when I choose to do it. Um, but otherwise I try and keep my head down. <laughs> Right. So in response to demand in a certain way, filtered through what media are seeing a sense yeah. that they're um, um, seeing a groundswell. Um, it's interesting that that interaction and that, that feedback loop that, that sometimes occurs. Uh, it's tough work. So, yeah, thanks for your insights, Michelle, there. Um, we've got a question for Phil. Um, this is a bit of a tricky one, I think, but I think you can take it, Phil. Uh, this is um, we have many academics who are working as critic and conscience of society. Why do you think that the perception of scientists being bought persists? Well, I was actually going to comment on that anyway, yes. <laughs> um, because of institutional racism, frank, frankly, um, to give you an example, um, found it reasonably easy to get resources um, to develop protocols and mechanisms for um, scientists to work with Maori communities, but I found it a lot harder um, to get resources to develop, um, or to get funding to develop resources for Maori communities to, to understand the science better. And, um, and, and even now, we still have to go to non-Maori to get approval for doing that. I mean, literally, that's what's currently happening. Um, and so um, the issue here is that we don't get the opportunity uh, to uh, unpack the science system. This is how it works folks. Um, people don't know that. So of course they go, their default is, oh, well, you're part of the system, you're paid by the government. I mean, I had a Facebook interaction with someone like that last week, um, who was just fixed on this view that we are part of the, we're, we're part of this misinformation uh, system, when in actual fact, we're not. But we haven't got we, we have not had the opportunity as, as Māori researchers in this space to actually develop the resources and the information necessary to provide a more nuanced understanding amongst our people. And so this has come to a head with COVID in my view. Um, and, and, and frankly, um, the various ministries involved um, need to take responsibility for this because it is their screw up. Thank you for that, Phil. That's a very solid answer. Lots for us to take away from there. Um, Rawiri, um, wondering about, um, actually, there, there might be for both of you, for um, Awarangi and Rawiri, um, what you're thinking about or what you've seen, some examples of um, what needs to happen in terms of adapting um, messaging for different regions and different parts of the country. Uh, can you think of sort of the kinds of things that, that that come back as that, that feedback when you're taking that ground up approach? Yeah, so um, some of the pictures that I showed actually actually demonstrate the different language that's being used in different geographical areas of the country, but also notice that in different parts of the country, actually there's quite a different way of talking about it depending on which group you might be part of. So Ngāti Rangatahi and their Ida Dot campaign versus um, protect your whakapapa versus, you know, and there's a whole range of other things. So you can imagine that if there's um, a thousand Māori communities, there would be about 1,250 different ways of messaging the um, vaccination campaign program incentive or intention. So um, it should be that way. It should be that we are able to talk about it in multiple different ways and use different language to um, motivate and inspire and 
incentivise people to get vaccinated. So yeah, I, I see that all the time. Over. Oh, you know, I, I'm just the same as Rawiri. Look, we were in um, Kaitaia and last week and we went down one street and um, we knew at least 100 Māori in that particular street were non-vaccinated. And as our team went down, I don't think there was a house that didn't tell us to get effed. Wow. <laughs> but I was, but you know what? We got 80 of them down by the end of the day to come get vaccinated. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to use whatever it takes to get them there. And it's totally different response to Kaitaia, to Pangaru, to Auckland. Yeah. What made that, what shifted over the course of the day? Um, that that street is just deeply stricken in poverty, right? Um, food on the table was the most important thing for them. Trust is just not there with government agencies or anyone who's seen to represent mainstream agencies. And um, you don't give up. So our guys just sit in the car with the nannies and just on the speakerphone chat outside the house. And then after a while, you know, and then we moved our mobile team onto that street just sat there quietly, gave them some food vouchers and so forth. It's just how you want to be treated, they deserve to be treated the same too. And even though they might have done that, that's a first response, but you don't give up, but you treat them and their whole family with mana. By the end of the day, they were all walking down. Yeah. Wow. That's absolutely I would that's, um, that resonates for me because it's really with the call centre work. So when we use Māori call centres, um, versus some of the mainstream call centres. So the person who gets, you know, a phone call that says, oh, giving you a call about whether or not you're vaccinated, and the person goes, oh, fuck off. And so the mainstream call centres immediately write that down as a hostile reaction, aggressively anti-vax. And our call centres go, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just stay on the line, stay in the conversation. Fuck off is... You know, it's just language. It's okay. So what's going on for this person? Let's listen to what is going on in their life. And at the end of it, they might still say fuck off, but they might not. At the end of it, they might go, somebody's listening to me. That's really useful. Let me tell you what's going on in my life, why I haven't got vaccinated yet or whatever. Or, and eventually we end up, most of the time, finding out that there's something that we can do differently. We can hook you up with the GP. We can organise a taxi. We can organise some transport. We can do some kai and some petrol voucher, whatever, whatever. It's just, so, you know, the conversion rate from phone calls is really different depending on who makes the phone call, just saying. Mm. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for those examples. Um, I hope that you're seeing the feedback coming in in the chat. There's a lot of really positive uh, reactions and some really nice supportive thoughts there. So do have a look, our panelists. Um, I think um, we'll draw to a close here. Thank you so much to our panelists for your insights. It's been uh, really incredible to hear from you and your experience on the ground uh, and taking the initiative and doing things that, um, as you say, Awarangi, there's not a, a roadmap here. This isn't something that has a, a you know, single plan that you apply. This is something that takes a lot intensive um, work that, that, that really um, bringing that, that you know, everyone's whole selves to this, right? Showing up to make something, make a difference. Um, it's been very inspiring to hear from all these examples. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining, all of you um, who've dialed in from SCANS and also from New Zealand Association of Scientists. Um, we do have a quick plug here. We have an exciting opportunity coming up to join the SCANS executive. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining a committee, it's not that complicated. It's really just about making things like this happen uh, and bringing people together uh, in networking and other events. So if you're interested at all, um, keep an eye out for the call for applications, which will be coming soon. Um, and we have also um, this SCANS conference continues through the week. Um, the same time, so 12.30 again, uh, lunchtime sessions every day this week. Tomorrow we have another series of really brilliant lightning talks. So I encourage you to come and check those out. Um, they're really a lot of inspiration uh, as well, hearing about the different projects and work that people have going on around the country. Um, so I'll uh, just close uh, with a karakia. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, kia tere te kāro hi rohi, i mua i te huarahi. A, ko te hoa haere, ko te rangi māri e. Hui e, taiki e. Tēnā, tēnā rākoutou katoa, thank you for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure to chair Ngāmihi Nui. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Peace out.